This is CBJ in 30, presented by Tell Ohio Credit Union. Find out more and open an account online at tellhio.org. Now, here's your host, Bob McGilligan. The anticipation builds as there are only two games remaining on the regular season schedule, and a playoff berth has yet to be secured. The anticipation is also there because tonight, the two teams the Blue Jackets are battling with for the final playoff spot in the Eastern Conference will both play, which will make the picture even more clearer for the Blue Jackets by the time they play in New York tomorrow. Welcome to CBJ and 30 presented by Telhio Credit Union. I'm Bob McElligot. You know, a wise man once told me, the anticipation is always worse than the end result. What does that mean? It means that we all go through life worrying about different situations, whatever those situations might be, something at work, a project that needs to get done. You don't know how it's going to get done in time. You don't know where you're going to find the resources, Uh, something at home. You don't know what's going to happen um, as far as your schedule goes or how you're going to get your child picked up from their sport or from school because something's going on, something out of the ordinary, and you know it's coming up in the next couple of days or maybe weeks, and you're worried about it, worried about it, worried about it, and you don't know what the result's going to be, and you don't know how you're going to get it done. And then when the time actually comes, it's nothing. You know, it's like getting that phone call from your boss saying, uh, yeah, can you come in? I'd like to talk to you. Come in early tomorrow. And all night you spend the night thinking, oh, my gosh, what did I do? I'm in trouble. I got to, what, what happened? And then it's, it turns out to be something good. See, you never know. But the anticipation leading up to the result is always the worst part. So, again, the anticipation is always worse than the end result. And I'll tell you who the wise man that told me that was. Gary Agnew, who was a former assistant coach here with the Blue Jackets and also was in St. Louis as an assistant. He was my head coach in Syracuse for six years in the American Hockey League. And that is one of the one of the phrases that he said to me that just made sense and has stuck with me throughout life. Now, in all fairness, sometimes the result is just as bad as you anticipated or maybe even worse. Not often. But once in a great while, and that's what the Blue Jackets have to make sure doesn't happen here. They have to make sure that the end result is them taking care of business, them getting the points they need, them getting into the playoffs, and not the Carolina Hurricanes and or the Montreal Canadiens. That's what they have to make sure of. They control the end result. They need four points, a combination of four points between their wins and Montreal's losses. It would also be helpful to get one point ahead of the Carolina Hurricanes. That would become very helpful to play within the Metropolitan Division rather than having to cross over into the Atlantic Division where there are a couple of landmines there. So they need that combination of four points. Now, the Montreal Canadiens are playing tonight. They're going to be in Washington taking on the Capitals, the defending Stanley Cup champs, and the Capitals certainly do have something to play for. They want to make sure, without question, they are the top seed in the Metropolitan Division. With a win tonight, they can set themselves up. On the other side, the Hurricanes are at home, and they are going to take on a dismal New Jersey Devils team. So, if things fall the right way, if they really went right for you, and how many nights of scoreboard watching have we come back from and said, well, that sucked. But if everything was to really go right, Carolina loses, stays one point ahead, and Montreal loses and stays tied, and then the Blue Jackets go out tomorrow, they win, they leapfrog Carolina, and they clinch a playoff spot all in the same night. That's the best-case scenario. And and that's the only one I'm going to bring up. That's the best case. I mean, look, Carolina probably doesn't lose New Jersey. You probably go into that final game where Carolina's playing in Philly and you're playing in Ottawa and you're hoping that the Flyers pull off an upset, and you're hoping that you get a victory. So that's probably the most likely, but we'll see. But we'll see. As far as Montreal goes, they've already played two games that I thought, and probably you thought, and probably everybody thought were going to be sure losses for them. In Winnipeg, they won that game. And at home against Tampa the other night, they won that game. So there are no guarantees. There are absolutely positively no guarantees. But the Capitals do have something to play for, and that is a good thing for the Blue Jackets. They need Washington to take care of business. And then the Blue Jackets can go about their own business the next night. 
So it's going to be really interesting to watch and see what goes on and what happens and how it all plays out. Here we are down to the final weekend of the regular season, and not a thing has been decided for the Blue Jackets. Not anything. Now, the Blue Jackets are taking on the Rangers tomorrow, and I'll talk probably more about this tomorrow, but the fact of the matter is the Rangers lost last night at home. They were embarrassed by the Ottawa Senators. 4-1 to one was the final score in the game. 4-1 to one for Ottawa, who just went in there and took care of business. So... My point to you is, if you think that these games are slam dunks, you are wrong. You are wrong. The other added incentive for the New York Rangers tomorrow night is going to be that Henrik Lundqvist is trying to win his 450th game. He didn't get it done last night. He's had six chances at it, and it hasn't happened. It cannot happen in chance number seven. It just can't. You've got to prevent that. You absolutely, positively have got to prevent that. So the Rangers lose last night. St. Louis Blues had a chance to move into the top spot in the Central Division. They blew it because they only got one point, not two. They lost in a shootout in Chicago, 4-3. The Anaheim Ducks knocked off the Calgary Flames 3-1 last night. Those were the only games that were played in the NHL last evening. So rather light schedule around the league. Uh, The other games today... Told you that Montreal is in Washington. New Jersey is in Carolina. The Flyers are in action in St. Louis tonight against the Blues. Nashville is at home against Vancouver. Boston in Minnesota tonight. Winnipeg is at Colorado. That could be, uh, well, that's a big game for, well, for both teams, really. I mean, Colorado's just about got it all wrapped up, and they're they're in. And uh, the Jets are trying to win their division so that they could play against, uh, well, who would they play against? Dallas in the first round. Anyway, big game there. Uh, San Jose is playing at Edmonton. Oilers are toast. And Arizona, as they fight to stay alive, they would have to get a win tonight in Vegas. So that's what's going on around the National Hockey League tonight. Not a lot. Not a lot. In fact, today's one of those days. Like, when you get two days in between games, you know, I, I did the show yesterday and wrapped up the game against Boston. Jody Shelley and I did the Inside Edge last night, talked to Oliver Bjorkstrand. I mean, maybe this is oversaturation for you. Maybe I'm giving you too much. I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps. But this is one of those days that kind of falls in the middle where I don't want to get too intensely talking about tomorrow because so much is going to happen tonight. So much is going to happen tonight. So this, I, I might just pick out a whole hodgepodge of things to talk about here over the next couple of minutes and and see how it goes. Why not, right? I mean, there's still a lot of things going on. There's a lot of things going on in the hockey world. So let's just talk about those. But first, I want to talk to you about Tell Ohio Credit Union and the fact that they've put their members ahead of everything else that they do. They've taken people. They've put them above profits. They've done it since 1934. They have an extensive website that explains them to you. They explain to you why you should join a credit union. They explain to you the terms of joining a credit union and what kind of perks they can provide for you at Tell Ohio Credit Union, the different accounts that they have, the different ways for you to take your money and make the most of it, the different ways for you to get money if there's a project that you need to get done. It's all right there. It's all spelled out, and there's a live chat option if there is somebody that you would like to speak with and get a little bit more specific about anything on that website. You can also stop in at any Tell Ohio Credit Union office as you happen to be driving around town Talk to a person, sit down, take a couple of minutes, sit down, have a conversation. What the heck? It might turn out to be one of the best conversations that you've ever had because it just might steer you in the right direction and put you on a good financial path. Tell Ohio Credit Union is open to everyone in central and southwestern Ohio. They are federally insured by NCUA. So where do I want to start today? Let me start with an article in the Hockey News. I read this yesterday. Ken Campbell wrote it. And it was about Justin Williams of the Carolina Hurricanes. I've said this all year about Carolina. I'm not the only one that's in this boat. Everybody has been waiting for the Hurricanes to drop off. And now here we are with two games left in the schedule. And they are they are really, really close to making it to the playoffs. So it is a, a real testament to what they've done there. And it's funny because they got the new owner. 
And he did some things that kind of rubbed people the wrong way early on. He let go Ron Francis as the general manager. Of course, Ron Francis is a Hall of Famer and basically showed him the door. Uh, Chuck Caton is a Hall of Fame broadcaster who was doing the radio broadcast there. He didn't renew his contract. They showed him the door. So there were a couple of things in the early goings that people were not very happy about there. But then there were some other things uh, that he did that were good, like as Bill Peters decided to opt out of his contract and go to Calgary to become the head coach and leave Carolina, they put Rod Brindamore, who was an assistant and a former great Carolina Hurricanes player, they put him in as the head coach. Remember last year, Justin Williams went there, signed as a free agent. They had no captain, or they had two captains. They had a home and road captain or something. It was stupid. It was just stupid. It was a bad concept. It didn't work. I mean, Justin Williams came in. He had started with that franchise. He came back. The prodigal son had come home and should have been the captain, but they didn't do it. Well, they fixed that error, and they made him the captain this year. And this guy, at 37 years old, has been incredible for them. So the article in the Hockey News talks about the fact that Justin Williams – felt that he was coming back to Carolina, signing his last contract, and that this year would be his last year of playing in the NHL. But now he's not so sure. And he's not so sure for a couple of reasons. Number one, he has been the driving force behind the Carolina Hurricanes. Rod Brindamore is quoted in that article as saying he's the most important player on our team. Now, you wouldn't think that a guy that has spent as much time in the National Hockey League as him who has won Conn Smythe trophies for being the playoff MVP, who is considered Mr. Game 7 because he is just so clutch in the playoffs. You wouldn't think a guy like that would be the guy starting the post-game celebrations in Carolina. But indeed, that's exactly what he did. He has a coach that trusts him. He has a coach that relies on him to lead the room and show the young players the way that they need to work day in and day out, whether it's practice or whether it's a game, whether it's the most important game of the year. Brenda Moore is quoted as saying that his work ethic is the same every day. And that goes a long way for a guy that has the credentials that he does. But he started the storm surge. I don't know if he ever anticipated or thought that it would get as big as it did and draw as much attention as it did. Drew so much attention They got Don Cherry to don the term bunch of jerks on the Carolina Hurricanes. They immediately went out and embraced it, made T-shirts, started calling themselves jerks, and just kept winning along the way. And Justin Williams is putting up some of his best numbers since 2005, 2006, 2002, 2003 in that range. So now he doesn't know what he's going to do beyond this year. He may be enticed to come back again. And quite frankly, I think he should come back again. The Carolina Hurricanes have been a thorn in the side to the Blue Jackets all year. I mean, there they are going into tonight, one point ahead of the Blue Jackets, facing a matchup with Washington instead of Tampa, a spot the Blue Jackets would much rather be in. But yet there they are, the Carolina Hurricanes. They are young but they have one of the best leaders in the game today in Justin Williams. And he should get a lot of credit, most of, not quite all of. I've got to give Brenda Moore credit. You've got to give the young guys credit for buying in and actually listening to the old guy who does know what he's talking about. And the ownership there backed out of all of the hockey stuff, and they just let those guys go about their business and do their thing, and their thing has worked really well. So if you have a chance... You can uh, read that article in the Hockey News about Justin Williams. I I thought it was good, and I I read it yesterday, and I was, you know, I was impressed, and I don't impress easily, as Jesse the Body Ventura used to say. So that's one thing to talk about today. I want to talk about, uh, I just want to go around some news and notes in the league, but as I'm sitting here uh, thinking about this, I should uh, probably take a look and see. The Blue Jackets are practicing today, and I'm just going to the airport to get on the plane. So I just wanted to make sure that there's nothing really happening um, at practice. Elvis Mers Lincolns is practicing. He's been practicing with uh, Manny Legacy. So he is on the ice. Of course, he has looked to be the future in the goaltending department. 
when and or if Sergei Bobrovsky leaves. I just wonder if this team was to go on a long run, if it would change anybody's mind. I really do. I don't know that it will. I'm not saying it will. I, I just wonder. I just wonder if you if you did have some magic, if you captured lightning in a bottle, and I mean that both figuratively and maybe literally, depending upon the matchups. But if you were able to do that, would that entice anybody to change their mind and maybe think about staying around? I don't know. Probably not. But... But I don't know. I, it would be a really nice situation to be in to try to get there and, and see if it did anything, to be quite honest with you. Uh, let's see. News and notes around the NHL. Let me just go on to NHL.com and see some of the stuff they have here. Here's a headline for you. Jack Hughes could be the next McDavid, Central Scouting says. I'm, I'm so – I'm about sick of this. I, there's – what I mean, and listen, I guess I should clarify what I'm going to say. You know, you get uh, Nathan McKinnon comes out, generational player. It's not going to be anybody like him for a long time. A couple years later, oh, Connor McDavid, generational player. There's not going to be anybody like him for a long time. Oh, well, guess what? Jack Hughes could be the next McDavid. Look, young, fast, skilled guys, I think they are going to be coming out in the draft every year. I, that's just the way the game is now. And – that that's there's going to be there are going to be dynamic players year in and year out but uh, Jack Hughes is the uh he's the um I don't know soup du jour that's what he is he's the guy of the day that they are uh just completely thrilled with they have him ranked uh, best assets compete skating in hockey sense well that's the, what else do you want right what else do you need you want a guy that can compete and the funny thing is they're talking about how he competes as a 16, 17-year-old in world tournaments. I get it. I understand. It's not like he's playing the boys down the street. You know, he's he's playing big-time minutes, Team USA, all that stuff. But you, the compete, then you have to make a big adjustment to the compete when you get into the National Hockey League. So that's why as scouts, the real trick is seeing he can compete now. Is he going to be able to compete against men once he gets there, and, you know, that's that's a trick to that. His skating, you always want good skaters, of course, and his hockey sense. That's compete, to me, of the three things, the compete and the hockey sense are the two most important. Because, yes, you want the skating, but if how many times have you seen a guy that is not the best skater you've ever seen, but he plays with his heart on his sleeve and he uh, he's smart and he can read the game and he can read his teammates and all that? I mean, those guys succeed. Regardless, they succeed. There's no doubt about it. But uh, anyway, Jack Hughes is the uh, he's the flavor of the month, and you will be seeing him in Vancouver at a draft near you late in June. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, here's one. Vegas Golden Knights defenseman Colin Miller has been fined $2,000 as supplementary discipline under – NHL Rule 64, which is diving and embellishment. Uh, that rule is designed to bring attention and more seriously penalize players and teams who repeatedly dive. <laughs> so, it, it doesn't happen that often. I always wonder what the guys say about guys that get fined for this. Well, I, I think that in many cases, guys that get fined for it, there's already been stuff said about them by guys on other teams long before this ever happens. But I wouldn't like to be that guy. I wouldn't like to be that guy to get fined for that and then have everybody just looking at me like I'm some kind of cheater and I'm trying to trying to do something outside the rules to get uh, to get penalties called. But, uh, hey, you know what? Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And what's the other saying? If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. And the trick to cheating really is not to get caught, right? So if you're going to... Do that stuff and try to draw penalties. Just don't be so – like, he's not a good actor. That's the point here, okay? So when he's done playing hockey, uh, acting is probably not going to be something that he turns to. That's my guess. That's what I would say. But uh, don't go there. Jack Adams Award goes to the Coach of the Year. I actually filled out my ballot this morning because the broadcasters vote on that. It's like I told John Tortorella a couple of years ago when he won it. I said, you're welcome. It was my vote that threw you over the top. There's no question. Um, I would like to vote for him again this year. I, 
I'm not, but, and I'll tell you why I'm not, because nobody else in the league, unless you're here and you have watched him day in and day out and you know what he has dealt with and you know the, the magic that he has done behind the scenes to even have this team in a position to make the playoffs, unless you've been around and you've seen that day in and day out, you, you're not going to vote for him, right? You're just not. That's the fact of life. You have to understand what he's gone through to vote for him. So I could vote for him, and Jody could vote for him, and Jeff could vote for him, and whoever else gets a ballot. I don't know. They say the, the broadcasters, but it's not it's not just limited to the guys that do the games. I think the pregame, postgame guys get it, probably the sideline guys, probably the guys that uh, you know carry the cameras and, and pull the wire that – uh, takes the cameras into the room, they probably get... No, I'm just kidding. But it, it's more than just, you know, let's say there's four guys per team, there's 31 teams. It, it's more than 124 people. That's what I'm trying to say. But they're, they're not going to vote for him. So Torts has done a masterful job, but that's not in the cards. So who who do you think should be the, the coach of the year? And I'll tell you my thoughts. And I... I'll be honest with you. I thought for weeks, I've thought Barry Trotz, Barry Trotz, Barry Trotz, Barry Trotz. And you know why? Because Barry Trotz took over an Islanders team. First of all, the the Capitals were ready to fire him. Then he won the Stanley Cup. Then they were in love with him and they wanted to re-sign him. And then he said, screw you. I'm out of here, which I respect a lot because he had an option. Go to New York, work for the Islanders. So he goes to the Island. They lose John Tavares. They're, every fan is tripping over his lip because he's pouting and sulking that he and her, that they're pouting and sulking they don't have John Tavares. And Barry Trotz comes in, puts together this very defensive-minded system. It's not fun to watch. It sucks to watch at times, but it works. And he's got his team in the playoffs, right? He's got his team in the playoffs in second place right now, and they've been challenging in the last couple of weeks to get the top spot. They've had it. They've lost it. So – for weeks on end, that's all I was thinking. Barry Trotz, he's got to be a slam dunk. And maybe he will be a slam dunk. But now here we are with two games left. And I'm looking at this. And I'm looking at Carolina and I'm saying, this is a team that I thought all year long was going to disappear. I thought they were going to fall out of the playoff picture. And they never have. And, of course, they still could. And if they do, then what I'm about to say loses its – glamour but Ron Brind- Rod Brindamore to just to think about what he did and I talked to you about Justin Williams earlier and how big of a part he is of it but you have to empower your team you have to trust your team you have to trust your captain you have to get the most out of your players and he's done that look at the goaltending tandem they have there Peter Morazic who they couldn't wait to get out of Detroit by the time he left for whatever reason they couldn't wait They would have called him a limo, put his stuff in it for him, carried him to the car, placed him in, buckled his seatbelt, slammed the door, and told the driver to go 110 out of town. Right? They would have. They were ready to get rid of him. So he's on the scrap heap. He goes to Philly. Couldn't even stay in Philly. And Philly's goaltending has sucked forever. He wasn't even good enough to stay there. So he goes to Carolina. And it's kind of a last chance redemption type thing for him. And, man, has he made the most of it. And then the other guy's Curtis McElhaney. We know him. We love him. He's a great guy. But he's always been a backup. You know, he's playing behind Bobrovsky. He could play. He's lucky to play 10 games a year. He's always good, always professional, good to be around. Blue Jackets finally wave him. He goes to Toronto. He's there. They decide... Do they want to go with Garrett Sparks? I wonder if they ever thought about that and thought how stupid that idea was. They had to be thinking about it the other night when Carolina beat him, and he played, and he was not good, you know? So so McElhaney winds up, again, he's, he's out of Toronto. They pick him up in Carolina. Best thing that ever happened for Curtis McElhaney is that the Hurricanes signed Scott Darling to be a goaltender, and then he – couldn't stay healthy, and he couldn't do his job, which to go way back to that Carolina story when I told you about Ron Francis getting fired, I think that had a lot to do with it. He signed Darling, and they gave him big money, and he was not good. 
So McElhaney comes in there and gets an opportunity. And just like Morazic, maybe it's a last chance. Maybe it's a last chance for you. And he has treated it like that. And those two guys have bonded. A couple of weeks ago when John Forsland was uh, doing a game here, and it was the Carolina game, I had to think because he's also been here to do NBC Sportsnet. But when Carolina played here last, John Forsland was here, and I interviewed him for this show, and I, I asked him about the goaltenders, and he said these guys get along and they're pulling for one another. And they've played almost equal number of games. Their numbers are as close to identical as you can get. And they like each other and pull for each other. Imagine that. Can you? Could you even think of that? There's probably somebody sitting at the desk at the desk next to you right now that you wouldn't pull for unless somebody gave you a million bucks. But these two guys have bonded in what could be their last chance to play a lot of games in the National Hockey League. So to me, I'm, I go, that's your goaltending tandem, and, and you're going to get into the playoffs, and you're going to get there for the first time in ten years. Congratulations to you, Rod Brindamore. You've done a great job. So I like him. And then another guy I think is a guy that left there has to be considered. And first of all, John Cooper of Tampa, I'm not voting for him. I'm not. They've got they've got the most points in the league, and maybe he wins it. Maybe he does. But to me, that's a that's an easy, stupid vote. And what I mean when I say stupid vote is almost anybody could run that team as well with the talent that they have and the way that talent is playing right now. Okay? Almost anybody could. When your challenge as a coach is to when you have injuries and you have guys that leave and you have to replace them and you're rebuilding and all that stuff, like that is a push-button team in my opinion. So forget about that. But Bill Peters goes to Calgary. And I didn't think Calgary was that terrific. Yeah, they made some good deals and they, they got a, a, some good players in a trade with Carolina. But their goaltending is Mike Smith, who's on the downside, and David Riddick, who is he? And again, they not only are they winning games, and Mark Giordano, their captain, has been terrific, but not only are they winning games, but they are the number one seed in the West. And they've got home ice advantage up until the Stanley Cup final, and maybe even then, depending on who comes from the East, if Calgary were to make it too. So uh, those are the three guys that I've centered on and I think have done – a really, really good job this year. So that that award doesn't come out for weeks on end, but we get the ballots and we have to we have to vote on that. And you know what else I was thinking? And I'll leave you with this. I'll leave you with this because it's a lesson for all of you, and it's a lesson that you should pass on. Here I am, a guy that grew up in small town, rural Pennsylvania, Somerset, Pennsylvania. Grow up there in a small town. Don't even think about, you know, doing what I'm doing now. I mean, I thought about it as I got older, but I never dreamed when I was a kid that I would be working in the National Hockey League and getting a chance to vote for the coach of the year. It's one of those things where I pinch myself and I go, is this really happening? Do I really get to do this? I mean, I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody from the Laurel Mountains in western Pennsylvania. And I get a chance to vote on this. That's pretty cool. So my message to you is that I leave you with today, and this is especially true for kids. I don't care if you're a boy or if you're a girl. It doesn't matter. And parents, pass this along to your sons and daughters. You can do whatever you want in life if you work hard enough. You've got to get breaks along the way, but you work to get those breaks. If you work hard enough, and you're a good person, it is my belief that you can have anything that you want in life. Those are the two rules. Whenever students ask me, what do you have to do? I just answered some questions for a, a former baseball player of mine yesterday who's doing a school project. What do you have to do to succeed in life, coach? Very simple. You got to work hard. And you got to be a good person. To me, those are the two rules of life. If you follow those rules, you can be whatever you want. You can go wherever you want. You can do whatever you want with your life. And I will leave you with that today. As I wrap up CBJ and 30, presented by Telhio Credit Union, I'll talk to you tomorrow from New York City. Until then, I'm Bob McElligot saying so long.